Greetings and welcome to Tuesday. It is the 19th of December and I am in my 12th house, so I'm reporting from the 12th house. And for anyone who knows astrology and even those who don't, I'll tell you what the 12th house is. That is the place you go before you're born. So Pisces is the 12th sign and gives us an inkling of what the 12th house feels like because Pisces is a water sign and it's the kind of water that's sort of evaporated. It's plasmic, it's ethereal, cosmic. Um, it's known for unconditional infinity and love and spirituality. Pisces people are very fluid. They're very flexible. It's a mutable sign. Um, water sign, the 12th sign. And um, it would be the home sign to anyone who's a Sagittarius that Pisces house is your home. So that kind of fits in with the Sagittarius. I'm known as a Sagittarius in the sidereal, but in our Western astrology, I'm a Capricorn. So, um, you know, I have that Saturnian influence and I have Saturn in Capricorn in the Western astrology. So I identify with both Pisces and, and the Capricorn fourth house home would be Aries. So Pisces and Aries. Now I had both the, my, my, my Piscean home would have been sort of a, anything goes. And my Capricorn home, which would be the Aries home would be sort of, uh, a lot of fire. And there was, it, it, there was a lot of fire in my home when I was growing up. So anyway, astrology aside, I wanted to check in. I had done a, um, a video uh, about the um, effects of having had postpartum depression after my third baby. And, um, instead of dealing with the hormonal issues and having it medically treated, they decided I needed to leave my three tiny children and go be locked in in a mental hospital and get pumped with drugs. Because Prozac had just come out that year and they needed people to study. Um, that is the truth. And uh, it, all these drugs and things or just experimental things for humans. Um, one of the things that I've studied for a very long time is the I Ching. And the I Ching is known as, it's got several names, the Book of Changes. It's also known as the Oracle. And it has 64 hexagrams and they're formed by two lines. One is a solid line. One is a broken line. And it is indicative of the yin yang, uh, principle. Um, and so there's different ways to come up with this six, uh, lined hexagram. Some people throw three coins, three matching coins. A lot of people use quarters. Um, I used to use quarters or if I was in a foreign country and I collected foreign coins, I would use, you know, three pretty coins, uh, matching coins and heads would be three and tails would be two. And you would throw the coins and then add up the number and that would give you one line. Anyway, it sounds complicated, but it's, uh, it's actually pretty simple. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because the I Ching has in the edition of the book that I got, that I first acquired it, um, it was given to me in 1998. And uh, the foreword of that book is written, translated by Richard Wilhelm. And the foreword of that book was written by Carl Jung in 1939 in Zurich, Switzerland. 
and I do have a video on my YouTube channel that is a, um, a reading of um, part one and part two of that forward, which was very long and it took, yeah, it took two, like eight, I guess it took maybe 20 minutes, not that long, but um, it has thousands of views. And I did that when I was in Mexico way back in the day in 2017, 18. And Carl Jung, I mean, I'd always known about him, but I'd known more about Freud, having grown up in, you know, regular Western public school system. And, you know, I had a degree in history because I love history and I still study history. So I never stopped. But um, Carl Jung has a very specific um, approach to psychosis. In fact, a lot of what he is known for, whether it's the Red Book and also his, um, not just his lectures, but his reputation of what happened to him um, during his, that conflict resolution with Freud and his own practice and uh, in California and a lot of places, people were interviewing him because they were so curious about his approach. It seems so different than you know, the Western mind. And, uh, and indeed, in the I Ching, his entire thesis in the foreword was about helping the Western culture and society to understand the I Ching, because the I Ching is based on something completely different, a completely different mindset. And um, so they have Orientalism and they had Occidentalism. So the Oriental is obviously, you know, the Eastern and the Occident is the Western. So those were the two paradigms and they were completely, you know, they were based on different perspectives. The Eastern uh, valued chaos, in fact, saw beauty in chaos because chaos is where it's sort of like throwing all the sticks up in the air and watching them fall and you don't know where they're gonna fall and where they do fall is somehow magical it just kind of in the moment and and I think that's because from what I understand all the laws in our societies are built on the past so they don't really apply to us what applies to us is this present moment the future isn't something that we know about because it is a mystery and the past is already done, so we're not really living there. We live in the moment, so that's where we're vital, it's in the moment. And I'm just, just conjecture, maybe this is where that split comes from. But uh, definitely in the Western, in the Occident, that it's based on the past, and all our laws are based on precedent. So um, that's where they're effective. But we're effective in the now, obviously. I mean, we don't live in the past and we don't live in the future. So Carl Jung, uh, just recently, um, I listened to a lecture about Carl Jung's approach to psychosis because I'm beginning to do a lot of research about what does it mean that People who have psychosis are hospitalized or institutionalized, they're medicated, and now they're talking about what they've been talking about for some time on how to catch people in the early signs of psychosis and, you know, begin to medicate as soon as possible uh, to avoid or avert, a, you know, a crisis. And, um... In Carl Jung's opinion and his approach, these psychosis states were not crises that needed intervention, except for that to keep the person safe, to be with them, make sure they know they're rooted on the ground and that there's someone there, you know, in case they throw up or something, I don't know. But just to have an understanding patient person, just to be there 
not necessarily to do anything. In fact, it's better not because his view is that these are very, these are spiritual emergencies that come about for some reason. For instance, they might come about, um, and, and uh, there's three um, branches of human philosophy that are needed that help us to go through these psychoses experiences. All of us have emotional disturbances. We all do. And some of us have early, early trauma that we've completely forgotten about. Yet that, tra that um, emotional disturbance could be uh, either triggered or colored by those early experiences that we were too young to be able to handle. But religion, mythology, and ritual to Carl Jung, those three things were very helpful in navigating these spiritual emergencies. And, you know, whether it's psychosis or some people call it mania or bipolar or manic depression, I mean, there's so many labels. But to him, these were all very valid, natural experiences, especially if someone had early trauma that was, you know, let's say if you were a small child and you were, you know, abandoned. How do you make sense of that? You don't. You, you know, the child will immediately make some kind of adaptation. And our bodies and our minds and our spirits and everything about us is continually adapting to our environment. And um, whether it's trauma or not, I mean, just if it gets cold, we put a jacket on. Um, you know, if the weather heats up, we'll take the jacket off. I mean, we're constantly adapting to our environment um, and that's our job. You know, if I'm thirsty, I'm gonna drink water and then the body will go, oh good, we got water. And it'll assimilate the water and then it's not thirsty or dehydrated anymore. And these are not things we even think about. These are things that just happen because, well, they just do. So a lot of what we do is just autonomic, automatic, just um, doing what comes naturally, you know? So Carl Jung felt like it was important not to interfere with that spiritual emergency. And if that person had a psychotic experience, um, it was necessary, and it's not going to last forever, right? Um, and uh, so I've gone through a lot of uh, study of late because I realized that not everybody uh, is supportive of when someone who has been medicated for what was considered a mental illness um, Postpartum depression isn't really a mental illness. It's a very natural response to the hormonal changes that happen while you're pregnant, during the birth, and afterward. These are all very normal kind of things that take place to stabilize the body and, you know, patience, just give it time, you know. In six months, I was not, that, that was the limit for me, and they, they ran out of patience and said, you're going away. And um, so that medication protocol began and uh, it didn't end. Unbeknownst to me, I would be still doing that for 24 years. And 24 years later, I realized, well, I had a bad accident and I couldn't have surgery. I needed dental work. They couldn't do any implant. They couldn't touch me. I barely can get chiropractic because my bones are so brittle from, um, two of the, the one of ones, one was in Boston at the university and the other one was at, um, Mass General Hospital. And they concurred that it was that regimen of these medications that had sort of leached out a lot of the calcium and minerals from my bones. So it was recommended that I try to taper off of these things. So that happened. I began the process in August of 2014. And by January 1st, 2015, I had completely uh, eradicated all of them. I was on none of them. So it took a while, you know, so August, September, October, November, six, five months, most likely uh, five months 
But by January 1st, and that wasn't really, I wasn't really planning it, but by January 1st, there was only one left, and I just said, okay, that's it, I'm done. And um, what they have now is discovered or finally named this um, situation where people who get off medication, which whether they've been on it for a year or 10 years or some 20 years, like me, 24 years, they have what is called a protracted withdrawal syndrome. Um, and some of the, like the FDA doctors and people now that are having to treat these people that have come off the medications, um, call it um, medication injury or brain injury, uh, traumatic brain damage. I mean, there's memory loss. I did have amnesia, um, but I didn't know it. I mean, you don't have, you don't know your, don't know. <laughs> I mean, I used to say, I don't know what I don't know. And then that's so true. And it wasn't until um, a good nine months into my cessation that I realized I had amnesia. I was asking questions like, where's my family? Where, why am I 2,000 miles away? And where is, why am I doing this job? And I mean, it was, I was stunned. I was really taken aback. I mean, I was just so was stunned about when I was able to actually self-examine um, what my life had become. And it wasn't all, you know, a horror show. I have, you know, been very active in creating and as a creator, a songwriter, and, you know, just other things um, for a very long time, for most of my life. But it was the fact that I wasn't, Oh, I couldn't understand how I got to where I was. And um, so there's this woman, um, and this was the first time I'd seen it. She wrote a book, and um, her name is Joanna um, Moncrief, and she's from the College of London. And back in 20, I think it was 2008 or nine. She wrote the published this book in 2013, and she said she'd done a study to find out how, um, you know, like the psychosis or emotional disturbances, how they came to be um, so pathologized and where the psychiatry industry had come from and, and the kind of medications that people were given and, you know, how do we get to this place where we're at, where a good, I think, 10% of all uh, people in the UK are medicated and there's m probably the percentage is even higher in the United States at this time, 2023, I don't know. Um, but she said that there was, um, you know, I, we've all heard this, this chemical imbalance. And, um, and there's this sort of kind of philosophy that if you have any kind of depression or, you know, if they're qualifying your symptoms, your behavior as manic or, you know, or bipolar or whatever, then there's an imbalance and taking medications is supposed to bring that back to balance. So if you're not taking the medication, there's this sort of like wild card going on and, you know, you could be like really dang dangerous to yourself and others, you know, whether you had been dangerous to yourself and others before ever in the past or not it, it that's not the point the point is that if you have these symptoms that they identified taking medication is the obvious situation and to put this person separate them from regular society so they can't hurt themselves or other people and you know sort of think you know watch them and put them on medication and and then you have update, you know, appointments, and you talk to the doctor, and you tell them what's going on, and, well, you want me to increase the Abilify, or should I increase the Seroquel? I mean, you're obviously having a hard time, and, you know, da-da-da. So, but according to her, and, and this is true, that these medications are no different, the majority of them, are no different than recreational drugs. So they, they're psychoactive, which means you're completely out of character. Uh, 
and they can kind of give you a different personality. Um, and, not, and not only that, but they interact with the symptoms. Your new personality is interacting with the symptoms and the side effects of the medication itself. So you're, you're literally having to deal with this new world. And, uh, and it's all because you're having some kind of psychotic experience or an emotional disturbance or something that is, you know, in our society, you know, these things are alarming and, and people don't want that around them. So they want to, you know, shelter this person or themselves, you know, so that's just, we all know the drill. Okay. Um, but what I'm discovering, especially with this, um, Carl Jung and, um, I'll leave some links so that um, anyone who's interested can look up these things. So this gentleman, Lionel, he said that Carl Jung saw them as natural experiences and to interrupt them is doing a great disservice because it, it can lead to a spiritual awakening. And like the shamanic tradition, these, these shamans all went through these incredibly powerful and intense shamanic experiences. They call them shamanic experiences. And some of them are induced by um, entheogens like, you know, mushrooms, ayahuasca, different things. People actually seek out these experiences because they're ac become acutely aware that the material existence just isn't enough. And if that's all you'd focused on, then you feel yourself completely vacant. And, and in addition to, you know, the, the psychoactive nature of the drugs, you know, the, the sooner they put you on the drugs, the sooner you begin to not care. So the main, um, I guess the main function of these drugs is so that, you know, you're having these disturbing psychotic experiences, but you don't care anymore. And, and it's the same thing with pain medication and benzodiazepines and opiates. I don't think that the actual pain leaves. Some of them do, I think, affect the pain receptors. But in my experience, because I've been, you know, had so many <laughs> emergencies where I was in the emergency room like half my leg cut off or something you know so you know I, you know we all know that experience of have, being on a pain pill and it's like you don't necessarily not feel the pain but you don't care anymore or you feel real happy and kind of you know happy pill or you know the happy gas or the laughing gas you know at the dentist and stuff so it's not really doing anything therapeutic except for you just don't care and that many years, you know, 24 years on those meds, I was aware that I didn't care. And I, I thought it was odd at times if I ever thought, you know, stopped to think about it. But I remember one time when I was like, you know, someone was behind me and I, should I hold the door open? And I was like, why do I care? I couldn't find a reason to care. So there was something, you know, like meaningful and heartfelt about interactions with other people that was completely missing. I was able to do a lot of things. In fact, I probably more because I was not hindered or stopped by my conscience. Luckily, I have a good, uh, you know, moral compass. So I didn't do like evil things or really bad things, but it, that's all can be relative because not making choices that were meaningful to your future or that you could, you know, that could some, to some people that's evil or that's, you know, immoral. I don't know. But I did, I made decisions more based on how they would benefit me financially. And that, you know, in the end, that that was good for everybody. That's what I thought. So it, it And there's also this um, syndrome called akathasia, which is probably the most horrifying experience I've ever had. To this day, it's been nine years since that day, January 1st. 
and I still at times if I'm very stressed and if I'm not taking care of all the four directions I'll explain that later but if I'm not keeping those things in balance I can sort of go back to that state and it's a dysregulated state they call it in PTSD um, dysregulation and it's where the emotions and some people they experience dysregulation by being triggered emotionally and it can stimulate a psychotic experience but there's different you know levels and degrees and obviously mileage may vary for each you know person uh, but that dysregulation um, is one thing and, and nowadays if I have that you know I, I do proactively treat it every day I do a meditation I write out fears and resentments and I give it to my highest self infinity creative intelligence God the Father and any entities I can identify as that feel real to me and um, that helps me kind of process the triggers and uh, get back to regulation because I supplement it with a meditation and it's a Vedic no mind meditation mantra based for 20 minutes and it just as a way and I'm myself personally I picture a figure eight in my mind so I can have both hemispheres sort of in sync and that works for me other people you can just focus on your breathing and say your mantra or whatever so um, the dysregulation and when it comes to withdrawing from these psychoactive meds um, Akathasia it, it's like an electrical charge and not only do you feel confused and disoriented but you feel like your blood is like electrified and is shocking you all the time and if you're alone in that situation and I throughout the past 10 years on and off I have been you know in a very enclosed sort of hermit like situation um, especially after you know March 2020 when all of that went down that isolation has just recently broken so um, it was a long time and um, but that architecture is um, it's terrifying it's just it's terror terror in from the inside out and and there's no drug and there's nothing you could do you know um, and maybe someone just hold your hand you know um, I don't know I got through it and I lived through it but not with there is damage because okay so Joanna Moncrief she did a study and she looked up the studies that Eli Lilly and other people had been, other pharmaceutical companies that were producing these drugs had published at the time these things came out like the early 90s like 1990 91 Haldol Haloperidol and then the other Olazapine which I don't know if that's Prozac or which one that is but they were doing all these studies on these drugs and the they used monkeys and after just a short period of time within a year their heads had shrunk and um, so you you basically burning up brain matter and I never thought I could that I I, I mean if I had known surely I would not have done it uh, but I have lost at least two hat sizes so yeah and and I think it was after I stopped the medication and it had been like two years that I had been not fasting but I had to my whole chemistry was reorienting and, and changing and I went on a completely holistic diet and did fasting and other things um, detoxes metal detox and parasitic detox and all these different things um, I was looked really bad and lost a lot of weight and I think I scared my family um, I wasn't scared anymore and I've never really had the kind of fear that I had when I first went off it I've not, never had that again 
or that I had prior. So, you know, be brave, be brave, and, and don't fail to reach out and, and, and call out for help. You really have to. And those who identify with you and those who are of your ilk will hear you and they will eventually be around. So, um, and that's all, I will, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, I'm going to continue the series because I, I need to unpack this and I need to share some of the information I've gotten that is life changing. It's liberating. Um, there's one that I am going to share on and it's about the, um, the island of Mu and it's this man who is from Hawaii who um, had an ancestral tradition um, passed down to him of these prayers and all kinds of beautiful, beautiful philosophical um, uh, teachings that ground, they ground you and give you kind of that settled feeling like it's okay that I'm here, you know, I'm here to be here and it be okay. That's going to be the first time in my life I've ever had both of those experiences, to be here, to accept being here and to accept the fact that it's okay. So, and just to show you that I forgot to plug in the microphone. So I hope this recorded. So um, I hope you have a great day and um, we'll talk to you again. Thank you for your time and attention.